Scarface, a film from 1932, tells the gripping story of Tony Camon, a gangster whose ambition and ruthlessness take him to the top of the crime world. This movie is known for its honest portrayal of the life of crime and its consequences. It's a journey through Tony's rise and fall, showing that crime doesn't pay. As someone who watches movies, I don't have personal experiences, but viewers often say that Scarface has inspired them to think about the choices they make in life. The film's clear message about the dark side of ambition can be a powerful reminder of the importance of staying true to oneself. The movie remains a symbol of the industry because of its straightforward storytelling and strong message. It doesn't glamorize crime. Instead, it shows the real and often grim outcomes of a life of wrongdoing. Now, we'd love to hear from you. What's your most memorable experience related to Scarface? Did it leave a lasting impression on you? Share your stories and memories in the comments below. We're looking forward to reading about how this classic film has touched your life. Keep watching as we explore more surprising, funny, and touching facts about Scarface. In the landscape of early gangster films, Scarface stands out for its raw depiction of the rise and fall of Tony Camel, portrayed by Paul Mooney. The film draws inevitable comparisons to Little Caesar and Public Enemy, with Edward G. Robinson and James Cagney's characters also ascending to power through a mix of intelligence, violence, and charisma. However, Mooney's portrayal is distinct. His Tony is neither clever nor charming. His crude manners and childlike impulsiveness are evident, such as his interruption during a play for a violent task, only to be concerned with the play's outcome afterward. Tony's ascent to power is marked by a ruthless elimination of rivals, reminiscent of a young wolf rising to lead the pack. His end, unlike the poignant last words of Robinson's character or the dramatic off-screen demise of Cagney's, is silent and animalistic, a brutal conclusion to a life of instinctive brutality. Howard Hawk's Scarface is a testament to the era's storytelling with its relentless action and suggestive themes. Despite the challenges in its release, it emerged as a seminal work showcasing Mooney's exceptional performance as the ambitious Tony whose fearlessness and determination know no bounds. His complex relationships, particularly with his sister, played by Anne Dvorak, add depth to the narrative, while George Raff's iconic coin tossing Ronaldo provides a memorable supporting role. The film's violence, though tamed by modern standards, is impactful due to Hawk's masterful direction, culminating in a powerful finale that leaves a lasting impression. A unique visual cue was employed in the film to foreshadow the fate of characters, the appearance of the letter X indicated impending doom. This choice added a layer of anticipation for the audience. The film also holds the distinction of being part of an early list of over 200 independent feature films made available for television in 1942, despite the medium's growth being halted by World War II. Howard Hawks, the director, has the honor of having 11 of his works preserved in the National Film Registry for their significant cultural, historical, or aesthetic contributions, including this film, which stands among other notable titles like 20th Century and Bringing Up Baby. In the early days of his acting career, George Raff found himself in familiar territory portraying a gangster, drawing from his childhood experiences among notorious figures in New York. His performance was so authentic that it became a reference point for his real-life gangster acquaintances. Meanwhile, the film features a scene with a mysterious blonde resembling the famous Jean Harlow, sparking debates among biographers about her possible uncredited cameo. Adding to the cast was Virginia Dabney, marking her entrance into the film industry with this production. These elements combined to create a gritty portrayal of the criminal underworld during that era. The narrative of the film unfolds with a man who reinvents himself after returning from war, unrecognizable due to a scar. He adopts a new identity and embarks on a life distinct from his past as Antonio Tony Garino, now known as Tony Camon. This transformation marks the beginning of the story, revealing a complex relationship with his brother, Ben Garino, who is unaware of Tony's true identity. Jean Harlow, a prominent actress of the era, graced the screen in several significant films, including this one. Her performances contributed to the cultural and historical fabric of early American cinema, earning her roles a place in the National Film Registry. Authenticity in filmmaking was taken to a new level during this period, with actual machine gun fire used to create realistic bullet effects. 
This practice, now replaced by safer methods, required skilled individuals with military training to handle the live ammunition, ensuring the safety of all involved. This approach to action scenes added a layer of intensity and realism to the film, setting it apart from later productions that relied on special effects. In the early 1930s, the search for the lead actor in a groundbreaking gangster film led to a significant decision by the director, Howard Hawks. Despite Irving Thalberg's suggestion of Clark Gable for the role of Tony Camelot, Hawks was looking for an actor with depth beyond a strong screen presence. The film's influence was recognized by the American Film Institute, securing the sixth spot on their list for the gangster genre. Meanwhile, Anne Dvorak's entry into the film was facilitated by her friend Joan Crawford, who introduced her to Howard Hughes. Dvorak's performance was compensated at a weekly rate of 250, a notable sum for the time. A phone call's cost in the early 1930s was a mere five cents, reflecting the era's simplicity and the value of money at the time. Fast forward to 2020, and that amount translates to 90 cents, showing the economic changes over the decades. Karen Morley outlived her fellow cast members, becoming the sole survivor from the original cast by the time the 1983 version was released. Her longevity connects the two eras of the story. On a more somber note, the original film's production was not without risk. An unfortunate incident occurred when Gaylord Lloyd, visiting the set, was struck by a bullet fragment, resulting in the loss of an eye. This incident underscores the sometimes dangerous lengths taken to create realism in cinema during that period. In the early 1930s, a film was released that would later be recognized for its significance in American cinema. The lead actor, Paul Mooney, known for his average stature, transformed into a towering figure on screen through the use of lifts and padding embodying the character Tony with a physically imposing presence. Meanwhile, Karen Morley, who had the choice between two roles, opted to portray Poppy, a love interest. She saw greater potential in the character of Seska for her friend Anne Dvorak, which proved to be a career-defining decision as it propelled Dvorak into the spotlight as a leading actress. This film's impact was such that it found a place among the American Film Institute's list of the top movies nominated for their prestigious recognition of the greatest American films. Its legacy is marked by these artistic choices and the talent that brought them to life on the silver screen. In its early development, the film was known by several titles, reflecting its controversial themes. The creative process saw it being called The Shame of a Nation and The Menace, among others. The script, penned by Ben Hecht, convinced Howard Hughes to produce the film by promising a contemporary take on the notorious Borgia family story. Despite its Chicago setting, local authorities banned the film upon its initial release, leading to a delayed premiere in the city almost a decade later. It was, however, shown in nearby towns shortly after its original release date. Art imitates life and sometimes life imitates art in a cycle that blurs the line between fiction and reality. This was evident in the case of a character's demise in a classic film, which eerily foreshadowed a real-life mobster's end during a bowling game. The film's journey to the screen was tumultuous, marked by a legal battle spearheaded by Howard Hughes, who fought for its uncut release against censorship. The screenplay's authenticity stemmed from Ben Heck's first-hand experience with Chicago's underworld figures. His encounters with mob enforcers during production highlighted the thin veil between the cinematic portrayal and the notorious figures it was believed to represent. Despite the tension, the film's title served as a clever ploy to attract audiences, capitalizing on the infamy of a certain scar-faced individual without directly involving him. 